When did you first become aware of Purdy Guns? Um, as a child, as uh, most people who, from my background in the UK, did. We grew up with shooting and country sports. England's ha England has a long history of um, country sports. And of course, they were the first ones in Europe to have organized bird shooting as mm -hmm. such in the Victorian time. And the, the name, Purdy, what did that mean to you when you would hear it? It was always the one that um, people talked most about. Their long history, Purdy started in 1814. So it's been around a while, 190 plus years or so. And at that time, of course, they were one of many. They must have been one of 150 odd um, makers uh, around in London at the time. And they, by only making the very best guns, succeeded in dominating the quality end of gun making in, U in the UK. Was there a point in their history where they said, we're going to pay attention to detail, we're going to make a high-end quality gun, or was it just always from the beginning the way they just did it? It had to be from the beginning, and that's how they, that's how they came to the ascendancy. There was never any compromise on it. And they were lucky insofar as they got the um, attention of various of the aristocracy of England and indeed uh, the aristocracy of Europe. And by their patronage, that was how they stayed at the top of the pile. If the, the Queen today is to put her stamp of approval on something, does that automatically make it, in, in your culture, the top of the line? If she gives you her stamp, as it were, <laughs> well, you, you, it's her warrant. Right. And of which we have three. We have a warrant for the Queen, we have a warrant for the Duke of Edinburgh, and we have a warrant for Prince Charles. Now that, um, of itself, makes you wake up, makes you pay attention. <laughs> and um, it's a very relevant um, honor to be able to have that. And so you do pay attention, yes. When we talk about these guns, a lot of people that are watching right now have heard the name, but really don't understand what we're talking about in terms of the price and then the value that goes with that. Yes. How high-end are we talking when we talk a high-end gun right now? How high-end? How much um, would a high-end, top-of-the-line Purdy go for? Anything from in dollars, hundred thousand odd dollars, up to two hundred fifty thousand at the moment. Wow. However, what you have to consider with any quality item is downline value and what you're buying at the time. Its history, of course, provides, gets you to that point. Its history has educated you to that point. And you then buy into it in its uh, lifestyle and what it tells other people of you. That's essentially what it is. You have to assume that the integrity of the gun is there. I mean, it's made to the best tolerances. It's made to the best fit, the, the finest um, finish the finest wood, the finest um, character. Right. It has to have that, of course. I was most surprised that the profit margin isn't what you would think, because it takes so much to make one of these. That's right. I mean, it, um, hands cost a lot to employ. Yeah. Hands To help do the audience understand, okay. take me through the process of making a gun. I call you up, I say, I want one of your guns. Okay. What happens? Well, you... Um, need first of all to be measured. Each of us has a different shape. We have different um, center of vision between our left and our right eye. We're, some of us are left-handed, right-handed, some of us are short, some of us are tall, some of us are wide, some of us are thin, etc., etc. So the gun then has to match your dimensions. So it has to go from your shoulder when you want to shoot, it has to go from your shoulder to the center of your vision. Just by putting it up, it needs to go there. And it's not being fitted to you, it's being made for you. And then we will make it to, to those dimensions. After that, 
everything on the gun is described by you. Length of the barrels, the type of rib, the type of choke you have, the shape of the gun, the length of the, of the stock, the set of the stock, the triggers, every single thing that you see on these guns is described by you for your personal Got taste. It. Yes. When it's happening, when a gun is being made, it takes approximately how long? The side by side here, which is this there, that's probably 450 man hours. Wow. And over and under, like this here, this is probably close to 600 odd. Now, th those are the man hours involved. That is where you have one of seven different trades. So a man will come and be trained by us, and he'll either be a barrel maker, an action maker, he makes the middle part, a lock maker, an engraver, a stocker, an ejector man, and a finisher. So you have the, all those different activities involved in making one of these. In the creation of a single gun, how many artisans will work on it? Seven. Seven different ones. That's amazing. And yet you folks have decided this is the way to do it. There is no skimping on it. Each one has to be an artisan there. There is no pressing. There is no artificial uses to make these. They're all handmade from scratch, correct? Yes. Um, when you say handmade, of course, we assist ourselves wherever we can. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, there are tools yeah, in we, the trade. We, we, we do invest in um, high-tech uh, CNC machines to make the building blocks right. of these. But a machine can only go so far. You then have to make it uh, what it is by putting the man hours in. You have to put the 450-odd man hours in there to take it beyond what the machine can do. Why hold on to this level? And I, in saying it, it sounds like a dumb question. But when we're in a corporate world that we are today, and profit margins and all of that, and there are guns being made that are two and three hundred dollars compared to what we're talking about here, there are ways to do things less expensive. Why, as a corporation, do you feel it's important to continue to do it this way? Because there's a market. There's a market throughout the world for this. There are men who still find great value in this. Men who find, find value in this find value in it for their time, and also it's an investment. I mean, you're not going to um, invest in one of these things and make uh, a lot of money on time, but certainly you won't lose it. Of all the gun makers in the world, Purdy is the one that does not lose money down line. Really? It's the one that is, makes the best investment. Even though they're custom made to the original Absolutely. purchaser? Absolutely. Wow. Yes. Now, you can adjust these guns, correct? If I were to buy a used Purdy, oh, yes. it can be adjusted to me through oh, yeah. reshaping. and. Yes, and yeah, it can be done. You can bend the wood. You can shorten the wood. You can lengthen the wood, etc. You can change aspects of the, um, of the ironwork on it. Um, you can do anything. Really. The oldest gun you've seen still in operation that's come through, how, how old would you say it is? Guns in use now. Yeah. Let's, let's think. Um, birth of the modern shotgun was sort of 1880-odd. This gun, um, that side-by-side -side there, was essentially invented in the 1880s. They haven't changed very much since. There have been a few modifications in you know, the mechanics of it and so on, but the um, look of it is essentially the same. So we have um, people still using guns that were made in the 1880s. Really? And they're still doing what these guns would do today. Difference between the side-by-sides and the over and unders? Yes. What is, it, what is the reason that somebody would prefer one to the other? I know very little about guns, but yes. I notice that that's definitely a difference between the two sets. Yeah. Essentially, side-by-sides are lighter in weight. They need less metal or less material in them to get to a certain weight. Whereas over and unders, um, being heavier, are more of a target shooting gun. Traditionally, they've been seen more as a target shooting gun. However, cyber size and over and unders have been around as long as guns have been around, as long as double guns have been around. It's just a question of which way what the barrels want. were put. Um, over and unders are preferred um, by certainly the sporting 
end of, um, of shooting, mostly because they shoot high. They inherently shoot high, whereas a side-by-side -side tends to shoot very flat. So you need to cover your target more when you shoot with a side-by-side, -side, and you can see the legs of your bird more when you shoot with a um, over and under. Now, in the family of these guns, there is a relatively newcomer, the Sporter. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that particular That's gun. this fellow here. He's the bargain price. <laughs> um, yes, th th this comes in at about 50% uh, of the price of the, um, of the other ones. Um, this is essentially a, a, an entry-level sporting gun. So people can take this from target shooting, you know, clay target shooting, and they can go and shoot um, live birds, etc., with it as well. It's a gun that covers all um, pursuit in shooting. Um, it's aimed at uh, people who want to come in but don't see that they can go all the way to the sort of investment that that takes. Right. How did you folks decide to add this to the family? With difficulty. Yeah, I would it's, think. Well, you, you have to cast your bread upon the waters sometimes, <laughs> you know, because um, it, it is a risk to say we're going to make a product that is uh, half the price of of that which we are offering now, and um, you know who who would then not say that uh, oh I'll have one of those instead of right. one of your top uh, top level items. But so far, it's been seen as a valid um, distinction. There is um, good water between the two; they are very different animals. Yeah, and the response from your your purchasers, your customers. It's been very good so far. Yes. Do, te very do good. people tend to buy a purdy and they're done with it? Or if they've gotten that hook in them, do they tend to come back for more? We have people who come back you know, as often as you know, every year or so. We make uh, for collectors. We make for anybody who sees that they want the product. Um, there are a number of huge collectors, of course. Right. And then there are people who have the ambition to have one and they've known it from their grandfather's knee that that's what they will do one day. They then set about in life to gather the wherewithal to um, come and buy one and they're just as welcome as the, as the man who repeats. You must hear Absolutely. some wonderful stories from people and their, their experiences with their guns. One does, yes. You do, you do hear various um, tales of the field, as it were. Yeah. Yes. Um, however, everybody uh, who has one of these things, uh, of course, is very enthusiastic about it. Oh. You know? <laughs> they would have and to be. Yes. <laughs> you wouldn't get one yeah. if you weren't going to be happy That's about right. it. Yes. Yeah. But it's something that uh, you've been educated to appreciate, really. It's not something that uh, people come to immediately. I read somewhere that depending on the economy, it doesn't really affect your sales, that your clientele is of a certain level, that no matter what really is going on in the economy, you're going to stay pretty stable. I think it's a rule of thumb that's correct, yes. Explain yes. that a little bit to the audience. It's like, well, why well, would the, that happen? The, the client level, we find about 40 or 50 people a year worldwide to buy these guns. So we're, we're making between 80 and 100 a year. That's it. That's what the world capacity to buy this product is. If we tooled up, we might be able to make a couple of hundred of them. We might not be able to sell them. It would debase the, the um, value of them if there were too many of them in right. the world. There's probably, in the history, in the history of Purdy, we've made about 32,000 of them. Modern, in modern format, i.e. this format that you see here, they're probably only about uh, sixteen to 18,000 in existence. So when you consider that in, in terms of you know, the world, that's not very many right. of them. Can you track pretty much every gun you've made? We have all the original records, and most, I would say that most guns have some sort of history written back into our records. But to say gun number X, Y, Z, where is it now? It would be difficult for us to know or well, to find that. To go back to the artisans, the craftsmen that work on these guns, as I understand it, there is also 
there is an apprentice period mm -hmm. that they go through before they are left yeah. left on their own yeah. on this. How, how's yeah. that process work? We have 16-year-olds write to us. I've done GCSE, I've done maths, design technology, religious studies, etc., etc., and I want to be a gun maker. Well, that's all very well. <laughs> but um, you, you need to come along and uh, then we'll test you. We'll give you a trial period. And, of course, you, know, you have to be able to use your hands to make these things. So it's a craft and a, and a skill that is taught to you over the time from 16 to age 21. If they can do it, then they stay. If they can't, then they're not allowed. It's um, apparent to us with a young lad that he's got the talent in his hands to be able to do it. How long see it. then is their career with you, would you say, roughly, on average? As long as they like. Once you've as long as they behave themselves. <laughs> <laughs> as long as they do as they're supposed to. Yeah, yeah, as long as they're good at it and, and stay good at it. Talk about the engraving, because I think that is one of the most amazing things on these guns, just from a, a visual point of view. Yes. Um, that is the part of the thing that is the art dimension. Mm -hmm. each, one, each one of these guns is engraved in a different way. And that is then designed by us for the client. The client will come to us and say, I want this kind of bird, I want this kind of scroll, I want this engraver even. Um, and we will then create the gun around his, his wishes. Engraving here, I mean, this, some of this engraving goes to $100,000 if it's you know, particularly sophisticated. Right. And it's like commissioning an artist. You will um, need to wait a period of time for him to get round to engraving your gun. And there are a handful of these very high-end engravers who provide investment-grade engravings. Do they tend to just do your guns, or do they do other projects, the engravers? Um, most of them are very pleased to work for us. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Do they sign their work in any way, or is the yes, gun itself they're, they're always... all signed, each one. Even our craftsmen sign their work. I mean, for instance, the man who makes the barrels, can, he puts his initial on that barrel. The man who makes the action puts his initial on The man who makes the, the lock and the stock and so on. They all sign the piece of work. And then that's all recorded in, the, in our company records. And that is a, a further sort of fingerprint of, of that gun's origins. Does that help or hurt the brand name as a whole? Oh, it if, helps. How do you see that? Because it's um, provenance. It is the, um, it's what people want nowadays. They want something that is of um, good origin and something of good report um, that they can own. I heard somewhere that uh, somebody had a, uh, the symbol of Playboy Bunny or a woman yes, reclining we've done quite a engraved of those. on one of these guns. Yes, naked lady guns. I don't think we've done too many of those. <laughs> I can only recall one, and uh, she, she was very adequately uh, dressed. <laughs> so but, you can uh, have the money, but you don't necessarily have the taste <laughs> always. In, indeed, indeed. We, we don't turn people away because of their good or their bad taste. You know, it's what they want, but uh, we would draw a line at... Um, you know, very naked ladies on guns. <laughs> can somebody design a gun and ask you to make it? Can they tell you, I want to do this, that, and the other thing that isn't in your standard designs? Oh, and yes, absolutely, yes. Any strange requests you've had for a gun itself outside of the engraving? Well, you can... Um, you know, we, we make guns for people who are blind in one eye or they've, you know, they've got um, deformed um, you know, limbs and so on, they can't shoot. Etc. Etc. We'll make guns to suit those people, absolutely. Uh, and I guess what I'm asking is more: if somebody said, "Well, I want four barrels on the gun," or "I want to do something," would no? We're a little bit more restricted in that in that sense. I mean, the me mechanics of the guns is are are laid down. Okay. Um, we can only do moderate um, differences in terms of the uh, the building blocks of the gun. The patents, the history of the patents on the guns is that at some point there were buyouts at different points of different companies, and that's how pieces came into being your property? Yes, uh, <laughs> our intellectual property, Purdy's. There, there are no patents existing now. There are very few patents in guns that exist now. 
that we'd be interested in doing. The original patents in the um, 1870s and 1880s um, were very strong. And for instance, the modern this this shape of, of gun, this top lever here, mm -hmm. is a Purdy is a Purdy invention. Ah. So um, Purdy was responsible for the form of most um, most modern guns. He he patented the way that uh, they the guns actually lock together in the modern in the modern way. Is there anyone nipping at your heels in this world? There are always people doing that. We're, we're not the only people in the world who do this. But how do you, you get, stay um, where you're at? It's a combination of making sure that your name is always paramount. And you do that by making sure that the product works. That is the, f the primary um, objective. They have to work. And they have to work for many, many years, you know, throughout the time that they're going to be around. They have to be seen as being reliable. That is the first thing. And the second thing is the quality of the finish is absolutely essential. There's no, there's no second um, level of finish on these. When you hit the level you've hit, is there any PR you need to do for the product? Do you have to go out and promote these, or do they in some way have a life of their own? Well, that, uh, that's a good question. I don't think I know that. I don't know the answer to that. They do have a habit, habit of selling themselves. They do go to people who come to you, essentially. Yeah. I don't know if we've ever sold a gun by advertising or turning up on some fellow's doorstep and saying, would you like to buy a shotgun? I don't think it happens. <laughs> don't have it doesn't door to door, door it, it, does not, it does not happen <laughs> with us. What is your dream for this company while you're helming it? Um, it's going to stay doing this. And it is valid. We, we find a market, and it's very good at the moment. In the last few years, have, it's been gathering pace. There are a great many people in the world who like to take these guns out and shoot them. <laughs> and As they should. We will keep doing it. A lot of companies, a lot of high-end companies, will end up selling their name or their image to other products. Anything your company has ever considered, thought about, and if so, why has it? Well, stayed? we already we already do that. We do we do lines of accessories, you know, soft goods and hard goods that are associated with our name. But that's um, that's a minor um, activity compared to this. Yeah. How this do you decide a, what can have your name on it? Um, by saying no. <laughs> yes. Well, that would work. <laughs> yes. No, we don't. Uh, we don't license. We don't um, allow anybody else to come into an intellectual property at all. The name is fiercely guarded by us. Now, uh, I have to ask: Have you worked with the Queen? Has she come for a gun from you? Um, yes, we look after. We look after. We look after her account. Um, she's bought guns over the years from us. But of course, they, they've been buying guns for 100 odd years from Purdy's. And uh, they don't need any more. <laughs> they have all they need? They don't need any more, exactly. They have all they need. And of course, the young princes use you know, their grandfather's guns. And so you know, the guns cascade down the generations like that. And so we look after those guns for them. If, of course, they want any more, then we'll be very happy to oblige. They know where to find you. They know where to find <laughs> us, yes. Thank you so much for bringing these guns yeah. in and talking with us about them. It's truly amazing to see such quality and care to an object still being done in today's world where so much is mass produced. Well, thank you for having us. And we're very happy to support your organization. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.